Coming up on this week in Linux, the long-term support version of the Linux kernel is now longer. SUSE announced SUSE Studio Express. We take a look at a preview for Plasma 5.11. We have an exciting update for the Librem 5 phone. We got some distro updates for Debian, Fedora, Solus, and more. We'll take a look at this week's Linux gaming news. All that and more on your weekly source for Linux good news. Before we get started, I wanted to address the new format of the show. Starting with this episode, This Week in Linux will be streamed live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern or 6 p.m. UTC. I recorded this week's episode this way, and it was a lot of fun, so for the foreseeable future, this show will be live streamed and then edited to be released later that day. I realize that not everyone will be able to attend the live stream due to a variety of conflicts, so I've also decided to release the full live stream video to all Tux Digital patrons. The edited version of the show will be available to everyone for free, but if you'd like to watch the recorded live stream in full, then you can go to patreon.com slash tuxdigital and sign up for any of the tiers. All patrons will be able to receive the full live stream. First up in the news this week, it was announced that the LTS version of the Linux kernel was extended support to six years. This is certainly great for a lot of reasons, such as having longer support for the LTS-based distros like Debian and Ubuntu, But it also is some very good news for Android users because it extends the possible support cycle for Android as well. This news makes it possible for Android users to receive updates for up to four OS releases, effectively doubling the lifespan of Android smartphones. The other top news this week is Purism's Librem 5 fundraiser has reached a backing of over $1.3 million, making it 91% funded over 91% funded. This recent surge in funding for the campaign makes it look like the campaign now has a lot of potential to be fully funded. I have been skeptical since the beginning as to whether it might make it or not, but I've always wanted them to make it because I'm absolutely interested in having this phone once it's made. So I'm very excited to see that it it is so close to being funded and still having two weeks left to go. Speaking of crowdfunding, this episode is brought to you by the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt. It's the shirt I made to celebrate the proliferation of Linux. Linux is so widely spread that it is very likely everyone uses it every day, whether they know it or not. The concept of the design has tux blended into the background to convey the message, even if you aren't aware that Linux is there, it probably is. The shirt is available from, for shipping from North America and from Europe. Up first in app news this week is Resetter. Resetter is an application that allows you to reset your Ubuntu-based installation, essentially like a factory reset. It isn't exactly like a factory reset, though, because you can make the choice between deleting everything like a regular factory reset and keeping your personal files and data and stuff like that. This release introduced some bug fixes and some performance improvements. This week, we saw some updates to a couple of email clients, Mailspring and Geary. Mailspring is a fork of of Nihilus Mail, which received a lot of hype uh, during the Nihilus N1 version of the application. But sadly, they decided to essentially destroy its usefulness. Mailspring is a fork with the goal of making a newer and better version, including changing some core aspects to to native code. This makes Mailspring much faster than its predecessor. Unfortunately, though, there are still still some caveats to Mailspring. The MailSync engine that used to be open source with Nihilus is now proprietary. So we can't really know for sure how Mailspring is handling your email. Nihilus Mail received a lot of flack for requiring users to create a Nihilus account in order to even use the email client. So it wouldn't allow you to skip the ID action, which made it feel a little sketchy to a lot of people because they have access to your email in a proprietary sync engine and in any kind of anonymous data claims were immediately contradicted. Well, to be fair, the Nihilus engine wasn't proprietary, but it is now for MailSpring. And unfortunately, Mailspring has the exact same account requirement issue. The developer of Mailspring is also one of the former developers of Nihilus, so I suppose they didn't learn from their, les- their, their lesson the, from the first time. Oh, and before I move on, uh, here's a quote from the developer of Mailspring regarding the cost of development. They said, Just 1,000 paid subscriptions would make Mailspring a stable business and help ensure its continued development. 
they don't say how much the paid subscriptions are. So they could be making ridiculous claims like Nihilus where you had to pay like anywhere between a hundred and twelve hundred dollars a month. Yes. A month. On a cheerier note, a new version of Geary was released. Geary 0.12. It introduces improvements for composing rich text messages, improved interface for displaying conversations, improved support for right-to-left languages, added in-application keyboard shortcut help screen, and much more. Unfortunately, Geary still suffers from a lack of sorting options, but overall this is a nice update. And just to be clear, Geary does not require any kind of weird account to use it. Next up, I'd like to introduce you to the Kawaii Player. Not sure. Kawaii Player is an audio, video manager, and multimedia multimedia player based on MPV. Kawaii is an open source and lightweight media player that combines that with a library manager. Uh, another unique feature of Kawaii is the media server, which gives it a very interesting set of features. Version 2.6.0 was released this week, improving various aspects of, of the player from the web interface, the media server, and the remote control system. Evergreen 3.0.0 was released this week. Evergreen is a highly scalable software for libraries that helps library patrons find materials and helps libraries manage, catalog, and circulate those materials. The Evergreen project is used by more than 2,000 libraries around the world. And I didn't even know this existed until recently. And it's pretty cool to see projects like this. This week we saw a release of Guitarix, version 0 0.36.0. But unfortunately there wasn't anything in the changelog for this release, so I can't tell you what's different. Guitarix is an open source virtual guitar amplifier for Linux running on Jack Audio Construction Kit. Connection Kit, not Construction, Connection. Which is a, you know, recursive acronym, so that's fun. I wanted to include this application anyway but, uh, because it is a pretty cool project that might be vital workflow for aspiring musicians. And um, it just looks pretty cool. <laughs> the Debian project announced this week the release of the second maintenance update of the Debian GNU slash Linux stretch series, adding a cons considerable number of bug fixes and security patches. Debian 9.2 includes over 85 bug fixes and over 65 security patches. Ike from the Solus Project announced this week the content delivery network and cloud platform provider Fastly are now sponsoring the distribution of packages from the Solus Packet Server. This sponsorship will increase the speed and reliability of the Solus package distribution as well as provide room to scale. Solus has been have seen some rapid growth so this sponsorship will alleviate some of the bottlenecks that's coming from that grow that growth. OpenSUSE announced this week that the Open Build service and SUSE Studio will be merged into a new combined solution called SUSE Studio Express. SUSE Studio Express will offer a collaboration option for image building. So that's that's pretty awesome. It will also have support for additional architectures. SUSE Studio only handled x86-64, but SUSE Studio Express will build images for all SUSE supported architectures. If you're interested in learning more, you'll be able to find a link in the show notes. Fedora 27 beta was released this week, providing a preview look at the latest offerings from Fedora project. Fedora 27 will come with GNOME 326, and we'll see updates for many applications such as LibreOffice and the Fedora Media Writer. Uh, something to, no to note is they are separating the Fedora 27 server for this cycle and are releasing it about a month or so after the regular cycle. This decision was made to provide more time to work on incorporating major changes in the modularity initiative. If you're interested in checking out the beta, you'll find a link in the download page in the show notes. To the download page in the show notes. Finally, in distro news this week, Canonical won't offer ISO images for the i386 architecture for the server and desktop versions anymore. Well, for 17.10. They will continue to provide security updates for existing 32-bit installations via the main Ubuntu archive. Essentially, the downloadable ISOs are being discontinued, but everything that allows them to be made will be continued to be made and maintained. This means that 
this likely won't affect any of the Ubuntu flavors. It, it definitely won't if they don't choose to, but the flavors could themselves choose to stop you doing it as well. But the ones that like Lubuntu and Zubuntu are unlikely to do that. Uh, it will also allow 32-bit based applications like g gaming to continue without any issue. So the only thing they are discontinuing is creating the 32-bit based ISOs up front. You could still do it for yourself if you wanted to. First up in the DE news this week, we have some good news and bad news related to GNOME. The good news is GNOME 3.26.1 was released, which includes some bug fixes and a few new features. One of the new features is a pretty slick, um, is a pretty slick feature called well, not really. It's not really named, but it is essentially enti entitled uh, "Smarter Window Snapping Resizing." This feature makes it really uh, easier to resize multiple windows at the same time when they are snapped. So I like that. The bad news is the developer behind the Top Icons Plus extension announced his decision to pause development on the on the extension. A few weeks ago, I mentioned that GNOME decided to remove the system tray from the bottom left of the shell and how GTK4 was removing the entire API that allowed the system tray to even work. I then predicted that the Top Icons Plus extension would eventually die because of this removal. Of the API, I mean, since it relied on the API to work. I didn't expect it to happen this quickly, but it appears the developer of the extension didn't like the way GNOME handled the situation. To be fair, GNOME didn't handle it very well. In fact, when making the announcement, they made a note to say that there's an extension still available to use the system tray, and then pointed to an outdated and unmaintained extension instead of Top Icons Plus. Before I move on, though, I do want to point out that the that the while the extension is not going to receive a lot of development from the attention from development attention from the developer, they did make note that it will continue to work for a while, and if possible, they will try to fix bug fixes. Um, bug issues, I mean, if needed. In other news, KDE Plasma 5.11 will be released this coming Tuesday, and while that's technically not this week, I think it is okay to feature it as a preview. Plasma 5.11 is introducing some nice new features, including a redesigned system settings, a new notification history system, and the new Plasma Vault tool. Be sure to check out the release notes and the release video for Plasma 5.11 to learn more on Tuesday. Atari announced that they are launching a new gaming system, the Atari Box, and it runs Linux. Atari said that it'll run Linux with a customized, easy-to-use user interface. The customization options and the potential compatibility has really piqued my interest. Atari says Linux lets us be more open. You can access and customize the OS, and you have access to games you've bought from other content platforms. Uh, I guess like Steam or something like that. There'll be a tons. There'll be tons of classic Atari retro games preloaded as well, and um, also current titles ranging from a, a, a wide range of studios. So it sounds like they're kind of doing like a hybrid of a console PC approach with em even emulation built into it. So this looks really cool, and the price is only about two fifty to three hundred dollars. That that is definitely interesting, and I am looking forward to this. It's kind of weird they're doing a Kickstarter, but overall it's still pretty cool. And especially if it has like, it's like a Steam, Steam machine plus a bunch of other stuff too. That's pretty cool. Antibody from the Xenotic team released a video walkthrough of the recent release Frantic Quake 3 style deathmatch arena by Cortez. It looks stunning actually and a lot of fun, so I'll need to check that out for myself pretty soon. As many of you know, I'm a big fan of Rocket League, so I had to include the latest big update in the show. This update added a new season with a soft reset, which is something they didn't do last season, so I'm glad to see that was done. They added a new map that looks pretty awesome, though unfortunately it has some issues with some rendering effects outside of the map when playing on Linux. It shows, instead of showing the background, it shows like a black screen wall, and uh, it's not, it's, it's very inconsistent as well, but it's still, it's still playable but it's a little disorienting. Probably the most important addition, though, it has to be the transparent goal posts. So when you're inside the goal defending the walls, you no longer have to deal with the walls getting in the way. I said defending the walls? That No. Anyway, 
This improves the gameplay to skill-based rather than just a guessing game situation like it used to be. Road Redemption was released this week, and I've been waiting for this for a very long time. This game was funded as a Kickstarter uh, campaign a couple of years ago, and it's been in a playable beta for a little while. But this week was the full completed version uh, released on Steam with day one Linux support. Road Redemption is kind of like a spiritual successor to the old Road Rash style franchise where you race motorcycles in various tracks while wielding weapons and attacking your fellow racers with them. Road Redemption turns it up a notch by adding a lot of extra mechanics including grappling hooks, shotguns, katanas, jump jet, booster pack things, and so much more. I've played it a little bit since release and I am really liking it so far. Stable Orbit is an interesting simulation game because it's a space station building simulator. The goal of the game is to create a space station and satellites that successfully orbit the Earth. But you can also turn on the sandbox mode where you can just create some random crazy satellites. Finally this week, Steam released the usage numbers for September and Linux usage has gone down to 0.6%. This is completely misleading though. because The information provided... Um, is is awkward because of the way that Valve collects the data. You know, that's just it's just really problematic. Uh, occasionally, I occasionally play Windows games, but it's very rare. Uh, a couple hours a month maybe at the most. And I only started doing that this year. Prior to that, I never played a Windows game for almost a decade. During this time, I have been asked for my hardware information from the Steam uh, hardware survey a grand total of one time. That's right. I've been playing Steam games on Linux since it came out on Linux, and Steam has asked me for my participation only once ever. I think it's fair to say that the numbers that Steam provides are a little skewed. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please hit that like button, and be sure to subscribe for more Linux news. If you'd like to financially support the channel, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash tuxdigital, or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere. Thanks for watching. I'm Michael Tanel with Tux Digital, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.